We're, we're going to try and get this uh, program underway here right now. Feel free to keep eating, of course, <laughs> but I'd like to um, introduce our speaker, Tom Minkley from the University of Wyoming, Department of Geography, uh, and get him into his uh, program here, uh, ASAP. So uh, just a, a couple of points about Tom for folks that weren't at the presentation last night. He uh, has his P, uh, doctorate and master's from the University of Oregon, Eugene, and bachelor's, two of them, from the University of Arizona, Tucson, and University of Northern Arizona. And uh, his research focus is on water stress regions of North America, and he's focused on the conservation issues uh, of the West, capacity of ecosystems to support stresses, all that kind of stuff. Um, basically, he, you know, his research is about ecosystems, and that's uh, largely what the talk, I think, today is going to be about. And it's uh, a slightly different than the title might have led you to understand, I guess. So I'm, go I'm not going to say anything more than that. Just join me in welcoming Tom Minkley. Well, uh, thanks again. Um, actually between last night and today. Uh, this is actually what I call my day job. Um, so if you're at last night's talk, um, it's, this has nothing to do with that, other than we're still dealing with environments in Wyoming. Um, I'm a paleoecologist uh, by training and a palynologist, which usually um, nobody knows what I'm talking about. In other words, I study pollen and spores in sedimentary deposits and I can reconstruct environmental histories. And from what I understand, you've already heard about this particular location. This is Natural Trap Cave uh, in the Bighorns. Um, and so uh, as of about last night at midnight, I haven't actually seen, I haven't thought about these data, but I made a new diagram yesterday. So we're all going to learn something together uh, today about the environmental history of the Bighorn Basin. Uh, it's about a 130,000 year long record that we have there. Um, and so um, this is the, it doesn't work. Uh, this is natural trap. Um, this is the opening. And uh, it's a really interesting place to work because a sunbeam will just transit the whole uh, cave through the day. And it's uh, about a 14 meter long fall. Uh, so animals didn't have a chance when they um, actually encountered this space. The interesting thing about um, paleoenvironmental records in arid environments is that we don't get a lot of them. Uh, Natural Trap Cave is, uh, for something that expands past the last glacial maximum, the last glacial period, there might be 25 of these types of records in North America. Um, I've been tracking them. I've produced three of those. So I have an 80,000 year record out of Mexico a 50,000 year record out of the prior mountains just on the Wyoming-Montana border, and now we have this one uh, from Natural Trap Cave. And one of the basic questions that we'd ask is, uh, so I deal with the botany end of it, not the uh, charismatic megafauna, is what we like to call these guys, um, is how have the flora and faunas responded to environmental change over whatever period of time that we can study? Um, so, uh, in this case, we have the quaternary period, the you know, period that we live in. Um, natural Trap Cave, I'll uh, show you some pictures of it, exterior and interior. Uh, my first drop in there, I didn't actually free fall, it was 2014, and then we uh, were in there last summer um, to do a little more research. And by preliminary results, meaning I literally just plotted this material up yesterday, uh, basically my colleague, uh, Mark Clements, who I think also has talked to you, uh, he sent me some new data, and I thought, wow, we should look at these things. So um, I'm very excited. Uh, wait until you see a pollen diagram, then you'll question my sanity. But <clears throat> I'm very excited. Um, <laughs> And so I do the pollen work, Mark does carbon isotopes, and that gives us a sense of the environmental inputs into caves. Now caves are a lot like lakes in that they are able to preserve this organic material in a very good way. So pollen is kind of like a milk jug thrown into a landfill. And that, um, so you could tell that it was a milk jug, but you, know, you might not be able to tell it's 1% or 2% unless it's labeled. So, it, but it has a long preservation history. 
and it can last millions of years. Um, the cave is famous um, for uh, what it actually is, which is a pit trap. So similar to hunting, you might have dug a giant pit into the ground and put some sharp sticks. In this case, we don't need sharp sticks. The fall will kill you. Um, and so it was really quite effective. Uh, this research was initiated by Julie Meachin at the, uh, Des Moines University. They were looking at the faunal assemblages. Um, it was on NPR. Uh, if you saw Wyoming Main Street, they've had a, a video about that, about the research that we've done. And so she is the one who got the grant. And she came to the University of Wyoming, and I said, who's doing the pollen? And that's how I got onto the gig. Um, we also have our team from the University of Wyoming, myself, Mark, and uh, students who went in and helped collect samples and uh, uh, other materials. Um, the, the site was discovered in about 1968 by cavers. Um, and they went in, they mapped it, and you know, tied off off of their VW bugs and, um, and you know, basically discovered this giant uh, cave system. Um, but the first research was done by Carol Joe Russian um, at University of Montana, and they found 20 species of mammals, five bird species, uh, including the dire wolf, um, ancient horse, mammoth, tons of cheetah, uh, American lion. So it's a really interesting and probably one of the most significant faunal assemblages of the late Pleistocene in North America. Where it's located, the pointer is not working on this one for me, but it's... It's still reflective. Okay. It uh, works, but it's uh, well, I think it's supposed to be internal, but yeah, yeah. anyway. Natural Trap is um, northern Wyoming. Uh, it's in the Madison Formation. Uh, limestone, the cave probably dissolved um, millions of years ago, and eventually it weathered and made this port on the top. Um, so there it is, it's just a small circle um, on the landscape. And the reason that it's so effective and kind of scary is as you walk up to it, or uh, and the reason it's graded, or as you drive to it, you come over a rise and there is a hole in the ground. So we have to imagine a landscape where you have a herd of horses trucking along, trucking along, trucking along, and they come over this rise, and a couple of them just go, Wah! right? And so then yeah, it's a bad day for that one. Um, if you're larger than a deer mouse, you do not survive impact. Uh, while we were in there, a deer mouse landed, and it floated just lightly enough, and that you know, shook it off and was able to scamper away. But if you're the size of a rat, uh, you basically, the internal injuries will take you out, which makes this great assemblage because there's nothing in there to move you. Sorry, you're eating lunch, but there's nothing to disarticulate you and, 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 and parse you around the space, right? So it's really an interesting deposit. And so where you land, you sit um, until researchers come. Uh, so this is actually what it looks like. Um, you know, there would be no reason if you're just a camel or a mammoth or a dire wolf walking along to think that you are in peril. Um, that's the cave. Uh, somebody did almost drive their vehicle into that. It's a 25 foot diameter uh, opening, so you could take a small car inside. Uh, it would be a short ride. Um, and, and this is the rise that you would come over, and so this is the weird intimidating thing, even though, even though you know that it's uh, caged. You come over that rise, and it's just, okay. What is the drop inside? Um, it's 14 meters. 14 meters. Actually, I thought when I, was going, when I went into the cave, I thought if I slipped, it would be really appropriate. And I would hope they would leave me there as, a, as an experiment. Um, yeah, I won't tell that story. But, um, but it is just gorgeous. It's, it's like an amorpha, so you go in, you go down the throat of the opening, and it's pretty straight wall, and then it just opens up like a Greek urn. Um, and, you know, and so uh, this thing here is a counterweight. It's basically, a, you know, they made it a little caver um, sculpture, but basically that's the counterweight that holds up the gate. And um, you go by that thing, and, but you just kind of go down on a rope 
and then you just start spinning and really just taking it in. There's old raptor nests up high. Uh, it's just a really beautiful, uh, cool experience. Um, and you can see the ferns growing on the opening of the uh, cave. So that's um, material that would be part of the pollen record as well. For pollen analysis, you know, often we go to lakes, and this cave is operating like a lake because it has an opening at the top. And then just the dust, you know, the light winds that we have here in Wyoming aerosolizes the material, and that just sort of filters in, and that's preserved really well, just as, as, and much better than, say, the animal bones. Uh, that's what it looks like when you're dropping. Uh, by dropping, I mean controlling your fall. Um, uh, the caver community of Wyoming did a great job of keeping us uh, safe. Uh, they give you about two hours worth of training and then they say, you're qualified to go into a cave. Um, I freaked out on the edge. Um, I, my freak out voice sounds like this. I really don't think I could do this. Um, and, but the cavers talked me down um, and it was a really quality experience. Is there another entrance to this? No. This is it. This is it. Uh, this is what it looks like from the inside. Um, I'm trying to, you know, not show you data yet because, you know, that's the scary part. But um, you can't work for the, about two hours while all the gear is coming in. So you just get to sit there and watch people descend and take in the view. This is really well lit. The light shows up at around 10 a.m. It's about uh, 45 to 50 degrees in there. So it's like being in a, you know, overly warm refrigerator. Um, but you're getting cold. It's 100 degrees out, you know, outside of the opening, so, you know, a little thermal shock. Um, and we just sort of sit and wait for everything to come in because you can't, uh, this is the drop zone where the ropes are uh, shown. Um, if you're, if something lands on your head, then that's a bad day for you. Uh, so basically, uh, that's where the accumulation of animals would have been. But again, you're sort of, for me, it's conceptually like being on the bottom of a lake uh, without the water. So that, it's a, a kind of an interesting space. Uh, this is just the light beam coming in. It, you create this hot spot, and then that just circles the room. And around 4 in the afternoon, the light goes away, and everybody starts shimmying out of the uh, cave. I don't know, last time you did 100 pull-ups, but um, it's, uh, women do so much better because they're smart and they use their legs, and all the men just come out with jelly arms because uh, I'm going to do it this way. It's terrible. Um, this is just, like I said, we just sit in there and just take in the view. It's just really uh, surreal, beautiful experience to sit in this space. Uh, one day there was a rain rainstorm, and so sitting under the grate watching rain come in, it's just, yeah, it's like this is one of the great aspects of my job is that um, oftentimes I get to just sit there. And so you wear hard hats all the time. Uh, and then this is, um, this is the excavation originally done in 1971 up until about 1983. Um, and so that would have been the original pile of material. So um, this is them excavating. And they're very, the, the paleontologists are very interested in the bones. And so uh, that means that they leave me alone quite a bit because I'm only interested in the sediments and the, the accumulated dust. Uh, so the reason that you leave me alone is because it's really uninteresting. Um, this is my section. And I sit there with a the trowel and every centimeter, I bag a centimeter, I put it into a bag, label it, go to the next centimeter, and then as soon as I'm done with doing that 475 times or so, I go sit and wait for the time to go out of the cave because it can't interrupt the other people's work. Um, this is a section that um, we haven't not done the pollen work on. You have this red bed here, which indicates oxidization, which is kind of odd given the environment. Um, the section I'm going to show you would be, a, you know, not spatially, but a different wall over here, um, but it basically is, this is our sampling strategy. This is Holocene age. Uh, there's a little roof fall, and then this is the uh, Pleistocene age. Um, and these sections aren't dated yet, so there's a unconformity in this particular wall. 
which is why I don't want to work it up, and the oxidization. Okay. So, why do we care about natural trap cave? Because of the charismatic megafauna. People love mammoths. And Wyoming was really scary uh, prior to um, humans coming across the Bering Land Bridge. But we have this incredible class of organisms, deer, giant camel, uh, you know, camels radiated from North America into Asia and into South America, it's our contribution to the world, uh, horse, equus, uh, the musk ox, bison, um, and then of course mammoth. And all of these things are found in the cave. You know, so everybody had a bad day at least once, at least in this assemblage. We also have the really super scary things that would eat you. Um, you know, the gray wolf, uh, the short-faced bear, um, what is that, about eight feet, nine feet at the shoulder. So, you know, you, <laughs> you know um, that could, it could wind you at 20 miles. So, you know, uh, really aggressive scavenger. The American uh, lion, which was larger than the African lion, um, so it was a really big kitty cat. Uh, the American cheetah, which is related to the puma, um, not from the cheetah line. Um, and dire wolves, which are now famous from Game of Thrones, um, yeah, because everybody needs one. Uh, there are no saber-toothed cats um, in the cave, uh, but there were these other predator classes. Um, and the reason that this is interesting from Natural Trap, you get these, you know, antelope. Why are antelopes so fast? And I'm still trying to find that there's the myth of somebody driving across Wyoming with a pet cheetah, and they let it out to see if it could chase down an antelope, um, and it lost the race. So antelope are really quite quick. Cheetah have that nice cutting speed, but it is thought that there is a co-evolutionary relationship uh, between cheetahs and the antelope with, uh, it's cut off on the top, the antelope line being at uh, around four million years, uh, cheetahs evolving about 2.5, the American cheetah about 2.5. So, you know, Natural Trap Cave gives us the story of these co-evolutionary processes. And um, this is just because I like this drawing, the idea of a cheetah chasing down an antelope is uh, really entertaining. Um, but we do have the uh, lineage of um, of the cats in North America and uh, natural trap. One of the things that the uh, Julie Meachin is looking at is maybe the uh, proving whether the cheetah antelope interaction occurred um, through genetics and then some physiology studies. Smilodon was at present in Wyoming though? I don't, think I don't think Smilodon was in, well, it's not a natural trap. I'm not sure if we have any records of it in anywhere in Wyoming, in Wyoming yeah. Um, so that's the stuff that everybody wants to hear about. You know, they don't say Ice Age, the pollen diagram. Uh, you know, it's the movie with Diego and the mammoth. You, everybody seems to have seen this movie. Um, really what I work on is pollen. So if you have allergies, sorry, it's not my fault. I just studied the stuff, and my stuff is really old. Um, pollen is the most common terrestrial fossil. Uh, as soon as it lands on the ground, it's considered a fossil by us. Um, and uh, this is a, a lodgepole pine doing its lodgepole pine thing. You know, we're about to go into car wash season. We all know this. Um, and it creates this nice scum on lakes. And so I don't have a good model for uh, caves, so that's why I'm going to use my lake slides. And what we, what it does is it, you know, pollen is trying to find the, the female gamete and make seeds. Why produce so much of it? Because pollen is super cheap to produce, especially for wind pollinated taxa. And so it lands on the lake and, you know, icky lake scum, and then eventually it's going to become indurated and then it's going to sink to the bottom of the lake. In natural trap cave, it doesn't have to do that. It just has to precipitate down. And there's no air currents in there, so there's no reason for it to, it's not going to be redistributed um, unless, everybody done eating, uh, unless, you know, something plops in and then does a dust plume. That's the only way that we're moving material. Yeah? So are your fossil pollen at all, do they cause, do they still have the ability to cause an allergic reaction? No. The proteins have broken down. That's a good question, though. I've never, 
Well, and then plus I treat it with hydrofluoric acid, and if you know what that does, do that pretty much takes care of all life. Um, and pollen grains are really kind of uh, cute. Uh, this is Mickey Mouse with a mustache, um, a fur pollen grain. Um, so really large bladders for aerial transport, the thickening of the wall. What species? That's fur. Fur. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, Mickey Mouse with you. That's a great question. No, I didn't say it. Oh. So okay. thanks. Sorry. No, afraid. no, it's important. I'm a botanist too. Yeah. Uh, this is pine. Uh, this is a uh, haplo. Uh, I'll throw this one out. Haploxylon pine. It has belly warts. So that's a white pine, um, which would have been an important uh, resource for um, Native Americans in the Holocene, uh, bears, the rest of the time. Um, this is Sarcobatus vermiculatus or greasewood, common in the basins of Wyoming. Um, is greasewood as, uh, as best as it starts to make? Uh, it's the stuff they put on railroad ties. Oh, cre the creosote? Is that the same? No, I, I don't think that I don't think they're extracting creosote out of that. But it's common in the in the basins. Uh, so you either have Artemisia or greasewood in Wyoming basins. Um, this is actually one of my favorite grains, is grass. Do you get enough pollen to be able to do a carbon dating? If you can't find anything else, yes. There's tons, of, you know. Um, is too much of a mixture then? To... No, no, you can, um, you can date it, it just, since it's, uh, it's in the, uh, this one, uh, grass grain, uh, is 15 to 25 microns. Oh. So you centrifuge those out and you can start sucking them. Um, you have to have a lot more patience than I do to do that. But there are, there are labs that will date pollen grains if nothing else is available. And the nice thing is it doesn't go, undergo diagenesis. So there's, you know, the carbon is, you know, um, prior to pro you could date just the exterior without uh, processing through to, you know, with the acetic anhydrides and the acid-base acid washes. If you have the pollen grains, um, prior to any treatment, it still has the genetic material even though it's collapsed. It's not viable genetic material, but you still have that carbon inside. Yeah. Um, this is the most common plant in the basins of Wyoming. This is sagebrush. Um, so it's in, I've seen this, you know, five million years old uh, coming out of the Bighorn Basin, and it's very distinct pollen wall. Um, and one, how we reconstruct climate based on these things is that we can quantify the actual changes in the past based on the uh, bioclimatic space that each of those pollen grains represent. And pollen climate relationships are really tight, uh, you know, sort of a R squared of 0.95 to 0.98. I mean, it's just a really tight environmental space. So the abundance of any taxa, you know, if you have three taxa and they have different environmental spaces, the, the more overlap or the less overlap we have, the better we can constrain reconstructing climate in the past. So we can get temperature and precipitation estimations. I'm it's sorry, really what is good. taxa. Huh? <coughs> these what? are just these are just in, invented taxa. It could be pine, grass, and mesquite. <coughs> oh, oh, species. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I'm in my botany biology. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, she knows I did. Yeah. Didn't understand the question, but so organism one, two, and three. Gotcha. Yeah, um, and where they overlap, that gives us uh, the ability. So when we look at something like a hundred thousand year record from Wyoming, um, I can't necessarily tell you the temperature unless it's the last eleven thousand five hundred years because that's what we know really well. But I can give you a sense of what the environment was like based on what I know about these. Uh, species or taxa. So, okay, that was the fun part. <laughs> this is what I do in my day job. Um, I generate graphs like this. This is a this is a pollen diagram. This is 130,000 roughly years of the Bighorn Basin. So this is you're supposed to be ooh and ah right now. Um, so. We come from, uh, paleoecology and palynology comes from the geologic tradition. We've been doing it for 100 years now, so we're probably okay with this. But everything is in stratigraphic order. 
So, um, and we don't have good dates yet, and I'll explain that in a little bit. So this is the section from an arbitrary zero. So we went up minus 25 centimeters above our arbitrary zero, and then uh, 475 centimeters down to the base, of, you know, where we could uh, get good exposure. And a pollen diagram is basically just a series of proportional plots. On the x-axis, we have uh, the relative proportion of all of the taxa that we're seeing, all of the species that we're seeing, um, and it's their relative proportion, and then you plot them in the time series, and then that gives you your environmental history. So each of these diagrams are relative to each other. Does that make, does that, so, um, and then I'm. So they all add up to 100%. Everything adds up to 100%. The gray is a five times exaggeration because maybe some rare taxa are really important. And so I want to see what they're doing. And so I actually exaggerate some of them because there could be some patterning in the, in the data. And then the lines are important boundaries that show the significant changes within these records. So that's kind of what I'm showing you here, is 130,000 years, so think of this as a really long movie. And we, and we typically read these from the bottom to the top. The important things in here, you have me all worried about the, my waist, I gotta suck my gut in. And, <laughs> Um, are things like pinus, pine. So let's just concern ourselves with the really bold ones, pine. Sagebrush is artemisia. Amaranthaceae is a common, uh, pigweed uh, is a common name, but it's a common herbaceous taxa uh, in Wyoming. Sunflowers are the asters um, and grasses. And you can see that Wyoming is dominated by sagebrush herbaceous stuff and then grasses, and we have a little bit of pine trees um, at the top of the record. How we would interpret this is that uh, if this is 130,000 years old, oh, well, I'll get to that. There's an ash at the bottom of the section, which seems to be a Yellowstone-derived ash, and it's 130,000 plus or minus 17,000, 20,000. So we have some sort of sense that this is at least the last interglacial period. So if we're reading our story, we have a lot of grasses um, in the last interglacial period, and then that switches over to sagebrush dominated, uh, low grasses, uh, sagebrush, and then this herbaceous component. So we're seeing that sagebrush expands going into, so it takes, about 80,000 years to build the giant ice sheets over Canada. We have Yellowstone with the ice cap here, but really we're, we concern, we we're concerned about the Laurentide ice sheet because that was the gorilla of the climate system. The, so for a lot of this record, it's really uninteresting. You can admit it, it's okay, I accept that. It's, but it's mostly a dry desert, something like you would see um, in Nevada. So Great Basin Desert, a lot of sagebrush, some herbaceous taxa, suggesting if I run a, that environmental constraint, it's something like a winter-dominated precipitation pattern like you would see outside of Nevada uh, near Walker Lake or Pyramid Lake, something like that. That's where the modern analogs put us in that environmental space. What's neat about this is this, this is usually what we know a lot about. The last glacial period and then going into the present. The last glacial period, relative to previous, appears to be really wet. So it suggests that as we're going to peak glaciation in northern Wyoming, um, well, peak glaciation is happening in Canada, but in northern Wyoming, there is a wet pulse relative to previous. And this is interesting because we think of whole glacial climates as cold and arid. And there are some uh, studies that show the little lobe of moisture was, sort, was possible off the Laurentide ice sheet. Um, and so this record here 
is indicating that relative to previous, not relative to now, it was wet in summer. Because we now have this floral component, a lot of grasses, um, a lot of sunflowers, and none of this dry, arid pigweed material, the amaranthaceae. We also are losing our artemisia, suggesting, again, that the, the flora of this Pleistocene environment in Wyoming is really diverse. And that's where we have a lot of our browsers. And so we go back to our megafauna, and what we need, want to do is now start thinking, who is eating this material? Does that change the diversity of that super charismatic megafauna? I don't know the answer to that. But this is really, you're the first ones to see this. It's exciting. Um, this last little period is the one of humans in North America. And so this is uh, fascinating. And it's something I wouldn't have expected, but pine, um, Douglas fir, spruce, this transition into the warm, wet period that we live in now in the Bighorn Basin, at the base of the Bighorn Mountains, was really a complex forest. And it does suggest that, that once you have the Laurentide Ice Sheet retreat and no longer influencing the climate of the region, there was a really big pulse of moisture, and then you had warmth, and then the trees were available to move in really quickly. Um, to give you a sense of what our sampling is, uh, since we just calculated this, every centimeter is roughly 260 years. So it takes a 260 years to accumulate one centimeter of sediment if we accept 130,000 years in this data set. So I'm showing you an observation every roughly 2,000 years. How much variability do you think might be in that, in terms of you know, actual accumulation from the air? Well, I think over, um, other than uh, roof fall, uh, those would be the only instantaneous event. I, I, I have to imagine that this being really constant. Um, and, it, and I'll show you why I believe that in just a second. Um, and that's because of the dash line, which I haven't talked about. But we, what we're seeing is that the, um, so just going back to our pollen record, the present is a lot of pine trees, a lot of forest that's shown in, those, in the far side of the diagram. And then as we see a little bit of sagebrush, we know there's a bunch, used to have more. And then again, the sort of wet summer indicator of um, the herbaceous component. I think it's interesting that if this is the last interglacial, the last time it was warm, we are not parallel on both sides. So it does show that in an interglacial, glacial to interglacial cycle, we're not getting the same responses on the landscape scale. Uh, I haven't parsed that out. Like I said, this is only about six hours old. Are, are you referring to the fact there's no pine? Is that what you mean? Yes. And, and pine, in even if pine was really degraded and there's no, the, the pollen is quite <coughs> attractive if you're you know, attracted to pollen, um, the, there's no degradation in it. So it does suggest that the pine trees were not in that region at that time. So what do we care, why do we care about it? This takes it back to the megafauna because um, really a lot of people don't care about plants moving around on the landscape. You know, it's the battle of the ants, um, for those of you who read The Hobbit. Um, what we do care about is what animals we're eating. And this is where we want to take this research. This is a figure of the North American grasslands and the uh, C4 potential. Uh, so C4 is an arid lands grassland, so if you have more aridity, you would expect more C4 components into the isotope uh, record. And we can look at the teeth of mammoth and bison, both being generalized grazers, and look at what they're eating. Uh, this is one of the opportunities that Natural Traffic Cave provides us. The red in this figure um, are mammoth samples, um, and then the gray are bison samples. And so this does give us an isotopic record of how we might be able to look at the vegetation history and uh, through a different data set. This is a lot of the work that Mark Clements does. So any technical questions, uh, I'll give you his email address. 
What we see in this record, um, as I said, the, we think that the ash at, and, at uh, five meters or so is 130,000 year ash coming out of Yellowstone. Um, that's the only one that I could find in the National uh, Tephra database. And, there, and it's kind of sloppy. It says, you know, ashes, Yellowstone, you know, 80,000 to 150,000. So I don't know which, uh, they haven't named it yet. But this is the loss on ignition. So this is another way that we look at these data. So each one of these dots would be that 240 year, you know, so this is contiguous, it takes a lot, lot longer and, uh, to count pollen than it does to uh, cook soil. Um, and we have this water content graph on the far side, which really is um, quite punctuated. Uh, this is the uh, inorganic material, salute, uh, um, in the, of each of the uh, centimeters. So that's just the rock and basically the aeolian flux coming in. The next thing we have is carbonates, um, uh, which would be um, precipitate. You know, we are in limestone, so you would expect a certain amount of carbonates in the system, and maybe that's a history of water flow. Um, you know, erosion off the surface as it funnels into the cave. And then organics, and so this is going to be that combination of plant material, the pollen, and then whatever body parts happen to be in the sample that I uh, collected. You know, that, like certain things sure, certainly seem like that's not normal. So, yeah. what does loss on ignition mean? And is this from your little samples? Your so samples each of the samples, so we, okay. yeah, so we take one cubic centimeter out of that. Right. And then we cook it. So the first thing you do is you dry it for 24 hours um, at uh, 50 degrees Celsius. And that dewaters it. So that's this curve here. Okay, and then the next thing you do is cook it at 500 degrees Celsius. Um, and that gets rid of anything that was organic. And then you cook it. Uh, and these are two hour burns. And then you, you burn in for uh, another two hours at 900 degrees Celsius, and that takes out all carbon. And that gives us a sense of um, autogenic and allogenic uh, inputs into a system. Yeah. Um, Why is the water uh, percentage changing so much? That's the really interesting part, which is why I have arrows there. Great question. <laughs> He's a geologist. And what material collects water? Clay, exactly. We actually are, uh, one of the geologists um, at the University of Wyoming, we're going to give him samples and see if we have cryptic ashes, because this actually might be a really interesting uh, history. I, and we're not looking at something great. This is a 3% to 1% water content. It's not big wiggles. They're graphed in a way to make it look like really substantial. But we think that we might have cryptic um, burps, for lack of a better word, um, out of the caldera. Because this would be the main main source of... What do we mean by cryptic? Uh... Uh, we can't see them. Uh, so if I can't see something, I, uh, yeah, cryptic stratigraphy means I don't have any stratigraphic reason to call something. So you're not actually seeing a layer of ash. It's yeah. discrete. Yeah, so the, the ash on the bottom is a good centimeter. Yeah, it's you know, like you're an ash, um, but um, we don't see that in these other cases. So, uh, but we can microprobe the sediment and possibly uh, see you know, what the clays are made of and if they're broken down from ash. So that's kind of that's an interesting uh, result. So, uh, and that'll help with the, where I'm going uh, because one things we don't know. Uh, this is the elemental carbon uh, isotope. Again, we have our organics percentage, the organic carbon, the organic carbon to organic mineral, and we're getting wiggles. Um, but the delta C13 organic carbon curve is the interesting one. And this is the old data that I didn't that uh, didn't show up yesterday. But we were really curious about this decline here. Um, but if we look at the shape of the curve. Once you get past about 40,000 years, we don't have good dating met, uh, methods. So this is why the ashes become really important. It's hard for people to believe we're saying 130,000 years because they know that we can't date past 40,000 years effectively. 
So what we do is we have this divot in the uh, delta C13. And these sort of curves are one of these things that we look at. We'll go to the ice cores in Greenland, and in this case, we have the deuterium and the uh, um, CO2 concentration. Um, this is 130,000 years in this red, and then you have this characteristic curve. So this is just wiggle matching. And when we see patterns in these wiggles on these long records, that's how we start tuning the records to say, okay, I think you know, if we're, we have 240 years per centimeter, that means at this point, we're at this point in time, oh, there's a cool wiggle there, um, that must be our age. So there's a circular reasoning that we have to apply to this because we have no other constraint. Um, so we often will do this um, using the Greenland ice core. There's not enough change in the water in the environment that the you would have more or less dust in the atmosphere, so you would change that uh, 260 years per centimeter? Not based on the pollen. Okay. Uh, it, it, this was a, uh, through that entire cycle, it was really arid. And, uh, and okay. summers would have, you know, it would have been, um, not vastly different than an environment we could drive. I mean, we could do the Pleistocene field trip because I know all of the modern samples and we could drive and say, oh, well, here we are at uh, 130,000 years ago and then we sit in the environment, um, drink water. Um, but if we take our wiggle matching, uh, these are, uh, these are uh, more reconstructions, not as simplified. We're back onto our normal axis or our <coughs> stratigraphic axis. And we see uh, here's the global delta C13. Um, there is a particular wiggle that has a decline at about 60,000 years ago. Um, the CO2, the delta C13 CO2 curve also declines, and this is a composite of a lot of records. This is a real, really well vetted ocean core, Greenland ice core, where we can do annual laminations in the ice core. These data are really good. We look at this and we see a consistent dip and we have this dip in our record at about 200 centimeters. That works out to roughly be where we would expect ourselves, you know, if it's 130 years, 30,000 years over the record. We have at least consistency in our estimation based on the Northern Hemisphere CO2 <coughs> record. So we feel really comfortable and plus we have the data on the ash on the bottom, so we're, you know, like, you know, there is a little bit of hand waving, that's why I move my hands a lot, but we feel we can tune this to the uh, hemispheric record pretty well. And so, this is all the new data. We've already seen uh, the pollen record, and as much as I'd like to talk about it more, um, I won't bore you with that. We do have the new oxygen isotope curve. And that first diagram I showed you, the, that decrease uh, in uh, protection, uh, the delta C13. Um, yesterday, all of the data came in, and we have this upper section, and it does seem like there's a decrease in that delta O13, which is this indicator of grassland or aridity versus moisture. There's the dip that is coincident with that weird forest expansion where you have dug fir and um, various pines and junipers um, at the base of the bighorns. And those would be, that, that anomaly is consistent with the vegetation and the Delta C13. So we're comfortable that it's not some weird anomaly in the uh, net geologic process of a, of a dolomite or anything else that would change the record. The other thing we have, the gray bar, if you can see it, is the um, um, first, uh, this, this, the uh, uh, one standard deviation of the entire record. And uh, what's interesting about that is that we are seeing that the warm periods, again, just trying to work our interpretations, are warm periods different than glacial times. Uh, they're both outside of the range of the uh, the 
uh, carbon isotopes within the sediment record of glacial time. So we're pretty comfortable that we are at least getting Eemian to Holocene uh, bracketing. Um, and so if we accept 60,000 years being roughly that dotted line, what we do see is that the Eemian was um, warmer than the uh, mid portion of the uh, last glacial period. Uh, um, I'm trying to use dates rather than uh, any of the various uh, words that are used to describe these, but Amian, a little bit warmer, then it cools down and you had a dry, arid uh, Wyoming basin. Drier than present. So it would be much more similar to central Nevada if you've been out there. Um, and then as we go to the full glacial, what's interesting and what we wouldn't have expected in a, a lake-based pollen core, uh, say from Yellowstone Plateau, is that uh, the lake glacial was actually wettish. And that's going to have environment ecological consequences for those things that are eating uh, the herbivores, that are eating um, the forage. Um, in other studies, we see that rabbits are showing up in this wetter period. So it does, you know, so uh, that's from Last Canyon Cave. I'm not showing you that data, but that's only 23 kilometers away. So we're seeing uh, fecal pellets of rabbits uh, arriving, and we're really confident that they're bunnies um, in this uh, wet summer kind of summer meadowy period if, for just to kind of give it an evocative um, look. Then we get into the present, and though you might think the basins are really dry, they're really wet. Um, this, is, this is a great time to be in the basins if you're looking for water. Um, so there's that. I had a question on that yeah. slide. Can you go back to it? Yeah. If you look at the pigweed and the sagebrush, there's pretty wild variations. Yeah. And is that from the way you measure it, or is that real? Is the population of plants changing and the pollen? What does it all mean? <laughs> um, I usually just I squint and don't see those. Because uh, <laughs> that's just a bet. Um, there's, there's a lot of natural variability, um, and there is you know, the possibility of cave falls or a, a big uh, flushing event. And so since I'm sampling roughly every 2,000 years, you know, um, there's not, this is not a, a really fine-grained analysis. If I were showing you um, environmental history for the last 11,000 years, um, you know, we'd be able to look at decadal to centennial, which I, I'd be able to interpret. But uh, that's just the noise in the system. And uh, statistically, they don't show up as unique relative to um, these lines here are quantitatively, you are different than the previous sample. Um, but yeah, that's, and pollen and analysts do not usually like that question. <laughs> it's a good one, uh, because these spikes look like they're real. And the, the way I do my analysis, um, I, I, I count a lot of pollen. And so I have a lot of samples on my queue, and I randomize which site I'm counting on any given day and where I am in the strat column so that there, I don't have any disciplinary bias. Because if you, know, if you see a bunch of artemisia, maybe you just, you, know, you had a bad day and you just want to see sagebrush everywhere. So I, um, I kind of control for that because I've been doing this since 1993, 1992. I've looked at a lot of pollen grains. I have favorites. Um, so where we are with this study is that we feel that we do have a full interglacial, um, glacial interglacial record. And that is important because we just don't have many of those in North America. It's a, it's kind of a, it's a really unique opportunity. Um, it was more arid prior to the last glacial period, which is slightly counter to how you would learn this in a, in a paleoecology class. Uh, but that's really unique to Wyoming as well. And we do have uh, records that indicate that uh, climatologically it makes sense that we would have more moisture in Wyoming, Montana at this time, at the last glacial period, relative to, say, Oregon, Idaho, and Washington. 
there was greater aridity because the continental, the, uh, the air coming off the glaciers was, uh, there was an anomalous flow and that was drying out the, that portion of the world. Um, the last glacial maximum, again, uh, mean, looks relatively wet uh, with greater herbaceous taxa. Why does this matter? Is that, you know, if we can describe, you know, this is the recent past. So the quaternary, the continents aren't moving uh, relatively fast. So the landscapes that you go hiking in every day are the same landscapes that we're studying. So we're just changing the drapery. And so, um, and then we have to also imagine that we lost these giant mega herbivores and mega predators. So how can we um, describe that environment that's actually important and scientifically relevant and interest people in uh, the recent past? Because these are the experiments that let us know how changes in climate, how ecosystems respond when uh, changes in climate occur. This is the only place that we can look is these records of the past. So it's really kind of relevant um, what happens when you have, like, as I was mentioning last night, what happens when you have a 1200 year drought? Well, ecologically, we can ask that question. What changes biodiversity? We can look at these records. Um, and so where we're going with the, the what we, Mark and I would like to do with the study is start thinking about these uh, Pleistocene landscapes with these big beasties on it. And um, actually, mathematically, we can, if we know the age of a, a fossil, a uh, mammal, and we can take the every mammal age around the point on the landscape that is natural trap and actually get population estimates on how many dire wolves there were, how many cheetahs there were, how many you know, mammoths there were, because we have an idea of the size of the range they would have. So anything that coincides with our point on the landscape, we can then do population estimates through time. And then we can actually see what they were eating. And that's ultimately what we're going to try to do with this study. So that's the newest of the new uh, for the old. Um, and um, if you have any questions, always feel free to call me. Um, come by, hang out in Laramie. My office is almost always open, because, or I'm teaching. So, but if you are there, come and talk, and I'll show you some more stuff. But that's all I got for you today. Thanks. Um, okay, so the only human remains, there was a atlatl um, stick on the top of the deposit, and that's what got our, all the archaeologists really excited, and there was an arrowhead, but that was also on the top of the... Uh, no, no person seems to have fallen in. You said that there was one layer of oxygen that was in the trap. Do you have any hypothesis of what created it? That... Spatially, it's just this weird section, and there's a red bed there, and so that's, I don't know why that would be oxidized. It is almost directly below the drop. Um, I did my sampling, uh, the record I showed, was I just walked around until I, it looked like I didn't have much roof fall, and, uh, you know, because I'm looking for fine sediments, pollen is really small, so I want to I wanna have it in that dust flux, um, so I just avoided that altogether, but the uh, Julie, they were really excited about because they were getting dates uh, on mice over there. So they were super excited about me working over there. And it just, it's too expensive and too time consuming for me to yeah. go with a bad idea. <laughs> what happens when the animals, you know, that had fallen in and they, you know, their flesh <laughs> dissipates up into it? Did that affect any of the. That would probably be part of the carbon, uh, the organic carbon. But for the most part, you decompose in place, um, and there's no, unless you're, uh, it doesn't look like there's a disarticulation. Um, so the animals, they land, and then, and so any sort of movement would be based on the shape of what they call the snow cone, because um, they're, yeah, and so there was a slight angle to it, but it wasn't a steep, you know, there's no angle of repose. So you would, you know, Depending on how you flail, there's no chance that you flail once you hit the ground. I've, 
<laughs> like I almost slipped on the cave, and I just told the caver that you know I'm going to be really mad for two seconds, and I didn't do the calculation, but maybe one. It'd be a fast, fast, fast impact. Would those, uh, as you look at those various charts, they look like there there is a combinat or a connection between them. Is it possible that there's something that happened substantially in some place on Earth that would have changed? cause that particular spike because when you look at your samples, your samples look like they're real. It's not that they're an outlier or anything yeah. like that. Yeah. And it just makes you wonder if you take a look at the cross section. Like things. here? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I just wonder whether... You mean like maybe, volcanism or something? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, and, and that's where we, you know, like going for those uh, water waves, and maybe that yeah. was a volcanic, you know, I mean, it's it's luck of the draw whether I would pull a sample um, from one of those eight volcanic ashes. But if I do and it shows up, I think that's really cool because um, so Mount Nizama, the Crater Lake, when that blew up, uh, we think that that was spring because there was there's a uh, an enhancement of yellow pine in those samples. And Pete Maringer, when uh, Mount St. Helens blew in '80. 1980, he put pie trays out and was actually collecting them, uh, the ash fall to look at the pollen because that, you know, maybe we can do seasonality of an eruption and, you know, get some more information about that. And I'm curious, has anybody ever figured out how you got such a nice wormhole? I, no. It's just, a, it's, it's really a beautiful piece of dissolution. It is. It's amazing. Yeah. Right? Whether it be from water rushing through or... Yeah, like I, you know, there in the cave itself, they're they're calling it the whirlpool, but there's another chamber down below it, so probably yeah. another hundred thousand years. But the BLM doesn't want us to go in there yet, um, and it'd be really neat to see what's going on down there. But the the opening itself was probably, I mean, I'm sure that's just all karsty, and you know, just honeycomb throughout there. This one location, um, and I've been reading a lot about caves, obviously. Uh, you don't think about it, but they, like a lake, they have to have a, a lifespan. They have to have an origin, and then they have to have a death. Um, and most cave, a lot of caves, the study that, um, um, that I reference, um, between 70 and 50,000 years, there seemed to be a lot of cave generation, um, which, you know, might just be the... It just got, we got lucky and you, know, you imagine it starts with the pinhole and then, but the way it's circled, you know, um, and the flow is actually not off the side that I am at. I, you know, it's like, you have to imagine these animals just like, and then the, the carnivores, I actually think that they probably were sniffing and then they go to the edge, go to the edge. And then you have that, you know, cartoon cat thing as they trying to scramble up and gravity wins. So, and could that also skew the number of carnivores that you would find, like in La Brea? Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, it, it, and so, w with the animal, for like thinking about the diversity, how I would want that study is that we don't have a continue. You know, um, the reason I like working with pollen in stratigraphic sequences is that I have my time series, and so I know that that you know A begat B begat C. With an, the faunal assemblages, the only way you know anything is by dating the animal itself. And so um, every animal should have a unique age because they're, uh, to me, they're a point in time versus this continuous record of accumulation. Um, so it could bias the record. It, I mean, it's kind of, I was hoping when we went in there that I'd be able to hold a skull, you know, like the <laughs> monkey holding the, you know, and just looking at a, Cheetah, that didn't happen. I was just super disappointed. So, I have another <laughs> question. Uh, does your work tie in or elucidate the causes, and what's your opinion on the megafaunal extinction? People. It's people. People? Yeah, it's almost 100% people. There, there was a climate, uh, yeah, there was a major climate change, but um, everywhere that you have mammoth, and people, mammoth always disappear as people migrate across the world, uh, everywhere other than where we co-evolved with them, which was Africa. 
So it's, 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 I'm very much on the Paul Martin end of the spectrum that, the kill, the kill, the, kill. yeah, and, and it's really, the mechanism is easy. Uh, Paul Koch has um, written about this. If you have a lot of protein on the landscape, um, you just have to kill large animals that don't, uh, have, that have a low reproductive rate at uh, a faster rate than they can reproduce. And so the gestation period and then the maternal care for an offspring, if you kill a mammoth every three years, you can still drive them to extinction within the time frame of uh, the mass extinction that we had at the terminus of the uh, Pleistocene. And the horses and, and all the other herbivores. Yeah, I mean, and there's thoughts of recreational kills, you know, because you have a pointy stick and you're just wondering, you know, how that thing dies. Uh, the only thing that doesn't really get explained is the skunk. There was a skunk that went. There was a skunk that went extinct, and it doesn't fit the pattern of having to be big. So where are all these bones that they found? Um, where are they the bones are deposited. Um, the, the the repository for the bones are in Kansas, where the original studies. Um, but uh, now the uh, geology museum at the university. Uh, is getting all the material from these latest collections. So you could go to the collections and go look at them. Um, yeah. In Laramie. In Laramie. Yeah. But we heard the cool stuff, the early stuff. Yeah, well, Real. those guys are harvesting. You know, what, what, it's 1971. What are you going to keep? You know, pollen grain or that skull? Uh, <laughs> they're pulling out a lot of horses now. Uh, and uh, the bone is decomposing enough that it's mostly just teeth. But yeah, so we're going to keep. Are they big ones? Is it They're biggest horses. Yeah. You said that, that Wyoming basically was always dry and sage. Yeah. But yet you were saying that there was a wet period. Is that the area up around Kemmer when you go and look at the fossils that are there? It's, it's aquatic fossils mostly. Right. Over the last 100,000 years, it's, everything's we're in the wet period now. So I'm saying that we're, uh, it's, it's super moist um, in Wyoming now relative to everything else. Um, yeah, the last glacial period was wet for being really quite dry. So that would be more of your Arctic, you know, because we did have the ice sheet. And that, yeah, you know, you'd have, you know, the adiabatic flow coming off of the Yellowstone ice cap, and then you have this giant, giant um, structure to the north. And so that's a lot of cold air. Cold air can't hold that much moisture, which is why I think that this record um, is interesting, because that suggests that there's summer moisture coming in, and so there was some sort of thermal breakdown of that adiabatic flow. But I would imagine winters were wicked cold, like, you know, four degrees cooler than now, Celsius. How, how much drier was it during those drier periods than today? You know, fifty percent uh, less moisture. If you had to put a number, could you? I couldn't put a number on it right now. Um, when we do uh, pollen climate reconstructions, um, the problem with it might work for this record actually. I haven't. I you know again. I just finished this so. Um, at high elevations, uh, the, with the modern pollen database, the, uh, so that was one of my dissertation chapters, um, sagebrush environments, um, there's 500 samples from the Columbia River Basin. So once you do this or do that to a pollen diagram, everything is the Columbia River Basin. So we were not growing wine. Uh, that would be a good conclusion for today. We did not grow wine during the full glacial period in Wyoming, even though the modern pollen would suggest we could. So it was not that warm. <laughs> so it breaks down. I mean, our relationships break down. And so that's where understanding, um, uh, looking at where analogs are coming from and in thinking floristically, uh, what does sagebrush tell us? And really abundant sagebrush does tell us that it's winter-dominated precipitation. Um, that's just what that taxa um, says in a pollen record. I think you said last night that some of the rivers you see today, though, um, like the Platte, could well have been ephemeral. Yeah, that's something we see. Not in, You wouldn't see that in this record. Okay. 
uh, that would be stuff that I've done in the Medicine Bow Mountains and the Big Horns and then the Absorcus. I mean, that says things were quite different. Yeah, you know, and, and even in the Holocene that we're seeing, yeah, so um, uh, Brian Schumann's work with the lake level, you know, we're not seeing an ecological impact with a large lake level drawdown, and it's from those lake level data that we would calculate the possibility of stream flow uh, anomaly. But yeah, that gets, so this is really a course, you know, if you, when you go into this depth of time, you know, 2,000 year snapshots, um, it's really, it's not the granularity that we have for the Holocene. Um, and because I'm weird about pollen, I have one record that I'm counting every centimeter so that we could actually do a comparison of, you know, of data sets that allow us to look at succession, that real response of you know, the environment to those anomalous dry periods uh, where we think the rivers aren't flowing. Tons of data out there. It's all sitting in my office. Come on by. <laughs> Any other questions? If not, then let's uh, thank Tom for... <laughs> no, thank you all for attending. And um, come on down to Laramie. We're, we're lonely. <laughs> it's windy. Okay.